Good afternoon. I'm Stephanie Nichols and I'm from the Housing Assistance Council. I'll be your host for today's call. Um, the Housing Assistance Council has been helping local organizations build affordable homes in rural America since 1971. For more information, visit HAC's website. Today's webinar, Financing Farm Labor Housing with USDA Section 514-516 Funding, is part two of a three-part series. The Housing Assistance Council is pleased to host this webinar sponsored by Tierra del Sol Housing Corporation and Community Resources and Housing Development Corporation through a grant agreement with USDA Rural Housing Services. This webinar, the second in a three-part series, will provide information to help project sponsors complete the final application process required to close on the loan and or grant with USDA Rural Housing Services. Information will be pre presented on finalizing development operating budgets, securing site control, compliance with environmental review requirements, assembling the development team of architects, engineers, and contractors to finalize plans and specifications, and completing the bid process to award contracts. The process for obtaining USDA approval for construction plans, the property management plan, and other RD requirements will, review, will be reviewed. Information will also be provided on layering other leverage funds in coordination with 514-516 funding and the requirements for completing loan closing process with USDA Rural Housing Services. Before getting started today, I just want to make you aware of three upcoming events. Um, we have part three of this series on February 28th, which will deal with construction and lease up. Um, there's a 502 packaging training in New Orleans in March. And early next week, we're going to launch registration for an American Indian Symposium um, in Rapid City that will take place in May. Um, additional information is also available on HEC's website, ruralhome.org. Um, today, I'm pleased to introduce today's speakers. Um, the first one is Jeannie Shaw. She's a nonprofit organizational management professional whose expertise has helped produce housing, community, and economic development projects throughout the United States. She has over 30 years of experience, and she uses a repertoire of skills to assist nonprofit organizations to build capacity. We also have Joe Antied. Um, she has worked at Community Resources and Housing Development Corporation for the past 25 years, providing technical assistance to nonprofit developers under the 514-516 program. I'm going to hand the webinar over to Joe and Jeannie. So I'm going to be introducing uh, Community Resources and Housing Development, just a background on this. These two organizations have substantial experience in the development of farm labor housing and in providing technical assistance uh, to develop, own, and manage farm labor housing. Um, COHDC has been serving farm workers since 1971 when they were established, and they have developed several different projects throughout Colorado and provided technical assistance uh, in the western region since 2002. Tierra del Sol has been providing services for farm workers and other low-income persons uh, since 1973. They also have been providing technical assistance to develop farm labor housing since 2002. Uh, they, are the, they are the technical assistance providers covering the eastern and central regions of the U.S. and CRHDC oversees the provision of those services in the western region, and I'll show you a map. So I think just to review, 514 is a loan that can offer up to uh, 33 years amortization at 1% interest rate, so it's a very affordable form of financing. The Section 516 is a grant that can be only provided to nonprofit organizations and government entities. Typically, when USDA provides the notice of funding, they offer up to $3 million as a mix of these funds for each project. And also, you can apply for Section 521 rental assistance or operating assistance, uh, which uh, is extremely rare in the world we live in these days. This is the map uh, that shows which technical assistance providers are overseeing each area. But it doesn't matter whoever you call, we will see that you are uh, put in touch with the correct technical assistance provider. And 
So today we are going to be covering the steps to complete the second phase of this funding, which is to prepare the final application and gather all the documentation needed to close on the loan and grant funds. It's really important to note that each project has special circumstances and requirements, so it's a very good idea to involve your TA provider to help guide you through this process. There's many pitfalls and obstacles that can be enco encountered, and we want to make sure that this process gets completed most expeditiously and smoothly. It doesn't always go that way because of uh, some of the challenges projects encounter, but we're here to help in, in whatever way we can as far as guiding you through that process. So the pre-application today um, begins with, or the, the notice of pre-application review action begins with a letter from USDA which indicates that you have been selected for further processing and they will provide a list of additional information that's required. So we're going to highlight some of those major items today, but there's many other several miscellaneous forms and, and other information that is required to complete that application. And again, I can't stress enough, it's, we encourage you to engage your TA provider to help you complete this process, not only for providing guidance on USDA requirements to complete the final application, but also to own and manage the project. And we do have sample, samples of management plans, management agreements, bid packets, et cetera, that can help facilitate your uh, time in, in uh, completing those steps. So now I am going to turn it over to Joe, who's going to cover uh, pre-development funds and gap financing commitments. Thank you. Um, so in series, the first series we got, you submitted the application and USDA said we're interested in funding and now we would like to uh, get you further down the line so we can close on this. Up to that point, a lot of the preparation of the application is estimates or what we think is going to happen. And now it's time to finalize those. So when we say the word finalize, it also means money. And um, I have yet to work on a project that does not need a source of pre-development funds. This can be home dollars. This can be a local grant. This can be the sponsor has some money. but. Um, Whatever, you're going to need a chunk of money, and it depends on the size of the project, but at, again, your TA provider can work with you and try to estimate what those pre-development costs are going to be. So now is the time to start getting pre-development funds secured. Um, your permanent loans that are coming into the project will have to have all the final commitments and all the conditions addressed on those because USDA in their loan closing um, instructions, it will dictate also that those funding sources have to be in place and a lot of times have to be closed by the time the USDA funds close. If not closed, they'll sometimes close simultaneously. If you're utilizing low-income housing tax credits, it throws a whole nother hoop into the game. And um, you will need to have your draft partnership agreement approved by USDA, the legal department. Now, I want to say all through this that I'm going to talk about with you today, I say USDA approval or USDA legal, but you're going to have a multifamily loan officer that's assigned to you at USDA, and that person is going to become your best point, your best friend, and your point of entry for USDA. So everything gets funneled through them. First thing you're going to want to do is obtain a copy of the title commitment, and this is from a local title commit company. And everything has handbooks and instructions for it. So again, your TA provider can help you with that. On a title commitment, um, there will be requirements that are necessary for 
everything to be done on those requirements so that the title company can provide the title insurance policy. This often involves a pretty detailed legal review of, of this information. So I've put a copy here of one that we had recently. And there was actually, I think, six more items on another page. But this can be quite a list of items that you need to collect and find out what they are. Do the, um, some of these might need to be released. Some of them are just information gathering for USDA. But you're going to have to address every single one of these items, and this can take a while. So pull your title commitment. Get a relationship with your local title company, because that is often who can host your closing when it comes time also. So in your initial submittal, you said this property is able to have um, multifamily zoning, and it's currently maybe in the process for being annexed into the city or something like that. Now is the time that you will need the confirmation that all of the, that that you stated in the pre-app is now actually going to happen and, or has happened. So you will need to work closely with your local city, town, to show that the project is in fact zoned properly, the plans have been approved, your utility, um, utility design has been approved, and um, you will also need confirmation that building permits will be available as soon as your contractor is selected and you close on the loan. Again, this is one slide. Seems like, uh, OK, that's the cha-ching, ch knock it off. But this process can take months. So I would advise you to get started as quickly as possible on that. And the engineer and the architect work closely with the city or county to complete the process for obtaining the final approvals. They get the drawings together. They get the utility plans together. They work with the local public works department. And um, when they are done, there will be off-site requirements likely. And maybe not, but there most could very well be off-site requirements, meaning there are requirements to get the, the utilities to the property or the roads, the streets, something that are not on site. And I just want to um, make it clear to you that those are not funds. Those funds cannot be used. USDA funds cannot be used for those purposes. Okay, So any off-site costs, you're going to have to have a different source of funding for it. <clears throat> You will engage a qualifying firm, and I put in parentheses here, one that has experience with USDA and their regulations will save you a lot of headaches. You want to engage a qualified firm that conducts comprehensive needs assessments on properties. What this is, it is an assessment of how much how, what are going to be the financial needs of the property for the next 20 years? The cost of this needs assessment is a, can be included in your pre-development cost and reimbursed at loan closing. This is an important document because it will estimate the amount of reserves that are needed from the project. OK, I'm going to skip here just a minute, because I have this use, This budget form likely looks familiar from the first presentation, because here we estimated that the reserve would be $30,000 per year for this project, when in fact now we are conducting the operating and the CNA, and that CNA will dictate what this number will be, and it will likely change. So this budget form that we used for the initial application is going to be revised more likely than not. With regards to your green component of your project, 
please be sure that you engage your green consultant early on in the project. Now this uh, might be, if you're lucky, an architect who is also certified to do this because that can sometimes save you some money. But oftentimes it's a separate consultant, a green community or a green a energy consultant. They need to be engaged in the proper in the project planning early on because they are going to assure that all of your construction documents and specifications are going to be compliant with the requirements of your green component. They will be involved during the construction of the project because they review the plans and then they do periodic testing on the project to assure that it has met the green component standards. So again, the cost of the energy consultant is allowed in the project costs and you can be reimbursed for their cost or you can do construction draws as you go for their um, services. This person should be part of your development team from the get-go. Okay. Now, your operating costs finalized. Again, this is the form that we showed you in the previous um, series. Chances are, th these were estimates, and chances are now you're firming up the cost. Maybe you've changed the project design a little bit. Maybe you've decided to go with a um, outside management firm. Maybe you've realized that you're totally tax exempt. Um, this budget will change and should change and be more accurate to what your actual project is going to be, as will this page here. I want to caution you on the rental income if the rent starts you will work very closely with your USDA multifamily staff person. We have had situations where maybe the project has gone on a little longer than we thought in this process, and maybe the rents need to be adjusted some or what. Um, you have to work very closely with your USDA staff person on any matters that affect rental income because it could trigger you having to redo your market study, and it could open up a whole can of worms. You will also need an ALTA survey of the, pro of the um, property, and there is a handbook guidance for that. Again, this cost can be reimbursed at closing. And an appraisal. The appraisal is ordered after the comprehensive needs assessment is done, and you know how much your reserve is going to be. USDA orders a, issues a, something called a statement of work, and you can order the appraisal. You will pick the firm. I encourage you, again, to work with the USDA staff person because they provide a lot of guidance on this appraisal, and you don't want your appraisal to get kicked back because it's not compliant. Um, but it, you will select the appraisal company, and you will pay for that and there's several thousand dollars that you will have to pay at this point to order the appraisal. Okay, you're, you're hopefully working on a track with your architect as soon as you receive funding approval where the architect is getting the final design of the project put together, the architect, the engineer, and the green consultant. Just some things I want to cover here is remember that David Bacon wage rates apply, as does David Davis Bacon monitoring. We are very aware that a lot of times the contractors might be paying more than the Davis Bacon wage rates, but that it does not exempt you from the contractor from completing the Davis-Bacon payroll reports and meeting all the requirements of Davis-Bacon. 
before the project is put out to bid, USDA has to approve all of the final documents, the final drawings, the specifications, and the bid packet. And they'll oftentimes have comments on these that need to be addressed and resubmitted. So again, I would suggest as soon as you have those documents together to submit those to USDA and the state architect will review those. And then if there's any changes that need to be made, those changes can be made. And um, then that chunk of your application, I can kind of just put the lid on it for a bit, because once the plans are approved, the project can be put out to bid, unless you're an owner builder, if you're going to do it yourself. But bidding and selection of the contractor normally takes 30 to 45 days. And this can be undertaken prior to the USDA closing. You, the contractor just has to realize that if they're selected, we're, we're not going to start. And usually there is a caveat written into the bid packet that says this is based on the uh, financing and the closing of all the loans. Most likely, your low bidder will be selected as the contractor unless, after you review the bids, there has been information left out or you've done your due diligence and find there's some shady stuff that goes on, and or the not and, and or, you also want to make sure that the people that bid on the proper project are not on the um, federal government debarment list. Um, just another blurb there about Davis-Bacon, and you can, typically what's going to happen is either one of the funding sources is going to monitor Davis-Bacon, um, or you have a third party that's monitoring it. If you have a third party that's in there, that is an allowable cost that can be put into the budget. So here is our 1924-13. This is the development budget for USDA. This is the one that we had in the first series. And these were our construction costs, total construction costs here at the bottom. And over here are our total soft costs for a total of $3 million for this project. We've put it to bid. and um, these will likely adjust. In this case, we're hoping not adjusting too much because we're at the $3 million cap. And if we go above that, we've got to find another source of funds before we can close on the USDA financing. The contractor, this, be, remember, the first time we submitted this, this was estimates. The second time, the, this last time around, when we're preparing for the final submittal, the contractor prepares this based on their bid. You insert the soft costs here. And then the contractor and the architect certify this. And this is an actual cost here and gets submitted as your final packet. OK, we have a template of management plans that follow the USDA handbook and can be adapted for your project needs. The USDA, um, the management plan section of the handbook is a bit lengthy, but it includes all the items that must be in your management plan. So the template we have goes through the regulations in that order and um, puts those items in the management plan. So hopefully, when USDA is reviewing your management plan, they can see it's in the order of the regulations and check off that you're meeting all the requirements. A management plan is very detailed and outlines the operation of the project. It's going to include all, uh, uh, as attachments, all your forms, all your processes your wait list process, your complaint process. So this is a very, very detailed document. And the idea of it is you should be able to pick it up 
if I'm coming to your site and nobody is there, I should be able to pick that up and figure out how to run your project based on that guide. Okay. Again, the management plan, I would suggest you get it done, get it submitted, because it's a huge document and it's going to take them a while to review it. And they'll likely have some comments and want you to adjust some things, and then you can do that and check that one off the list. Bidding the project. Once the USDA state architect has approved the construction documents, the final plans, the specifications, it's time to put the project out to bid. Make sure the bid notice is published in a major new newspaper that serves the area. You don't want to put it in a little community um, handout or something because you want to be able to show that you are putting this out there, in fact, to anyone who could bid in the area. Allow plenty of time for contractors to respond, usually the 30 to 45 days. And here's my personal experience with this one. If you shorten that much, you might likely cut down on who's going to respond, and um, they miss items in the bid because they did it so quickly. Clearly describe in your advertisement when, where, and how the bids are to be submitted, the due date. And typically what happens on that due date is you have a bid opening. So the bids are due at 5 o'clock. At 5.15, you sit down, um, say you're a nonprofit, you sit down with your board and the architect, and you open the bids. And it's a public meeting, and you announce those. But you do not announce the winner. Because prior to the awarding the bids, you're going to go back to the office, you and the architect, review for accuracy, see if they left anything out, um, make sure they're in compliance with everything that's required of USDA, um, make sure they've provided evidence of the insurances, and then making sure they're not debarred from the federal government. Once you have all that, you're probably able to make the award. Once the award is made, the pre-construction conference is scheduled with the contractor and the state architect. This is a meeting where you, the state architect, your architect, and the contractor sit down and you go through the entire USDA draw process. There, what's required on site in terms of signage and fences and um, the Davis-Bacon is reviewed. This can be done prior to the USDA closing. And I've actually, we covered that in the previous one. But um, we, I have done projects where you hold this construction conference prior to the USDA closing. And the reason we did that is as soon as the USDA closing was done, the contractor wanted to start. So we had the closing at 10 o'clock in the morning, and the contractor wanted to put up the fence at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Okay. Um, so there are, this just kind of illustrates kind of the tracks that are going on, if you will. Over on the far left, we've got our final planning and zoning getting our plans and specs done, and getting them approved by the city and USDA, and the project goes out for bid opening. In the middle here is the financing stuff. We're getting all of our financing together, all of our um, final commitments, and making sure everything jives when you have several multi multi-layers of funding, it can sometimes be a trick to make sure that everybody is going to be OK with um, your rents, your reserve requirements, um, those kind of things, your occupancy. And on the far right, we have the CNA, the Comprehensive Needs Assessment, and the appraisal. Those get done, and then you can finalize your operating budget, your management plan, your management agreement. And hopefully, those items start to bring together your 
final submittal and you're getting prepared for closing. I will tell you, if you're working closely with your USDA staff person, a lot of times, say you have the management plan done, you can ask them, can I go ahead and submit that to you? Um, the final plans and specs, most of the time, the state architect wants to look at those so those can be submitted. So it's not, so to speak, a big packet of a final submittal oftentimes that you're submitting. It's kind of a figure of speech that we're getting to for the final loan closing. And um, so Joe, th this is Jeannie. I just wanted to add, um, <clears throat> we didn't uh, touch too much on this in the beginning, but sources of pre-development loans include the Housing Assistance Council, of course. Uh, a lot of you may be familiar with that, but it also includes RCAC, LISC, uh, other private lenders. Community Housing Capital is a lender that I'm aware of, uh, NeighborWorks, uh, um, and you may have others that you work with. So be sure to be talking to them early on about what the requirements are for pre-development uh, loans uh, because you will need that uh, if the project is selected for further processing, if those funds are needed to complete all these steps, it's important to know timing-wise that they're going to be available to move through this process. And then another aspect that I wanted to mention is that um, to submit your build for your building permits once rural development approves the, those plans because that also can be a process on the part of the municipality who is reviewing those documents and you want to allow time for any uh, comments that they may have. Um, so I think the, the best advice is to be um, looking at uh, how, how you can take all these steps on simultaneously to ensure that everything comes down to a timely conclusion at loan closing. And I wanted to add one more thing about the um, green component. And everybody, it just seems like we're just kind of evolving in this green component stuff. But I want to encourage you to make sure that somewhere in your agreements, either with architect or with your green consultant that you're working with, that it's very clear what inspections are involved, what their role is, what um, big deal is what your payment is for because um, we've had some projects at the maybe you know you're well into it and it's like oh we charge extra for that we charge extra for that we charge extra for that and that was not outlined originally in the agreements so I encourage you to just make sure that it's very clear that um, those are outlined and who is paying for them Ladies, we have a question in the chat. So I know that we're. I'm sorry. Do you want me to ask the question? Um, Go ahead. There's, there's a great question about what is the trigger for Davis Bacon? Um, is it programmatic using the 516 five, versus 514? Okay, I'm probably going to have to defer to somebody who's a USDA person here. I have never worked on one that did not include loan and grant. So it was, so I I, I don't know the accurate answer to that. Okay, well we'll we'll re-ask that here in a second. In the Twenty-five we years. Open it, it up. Okay. All right. Should I open up the phone lines? Are we ready and, for uh, Well, speaking of open it up, yeah, let's let's open it up. If, if, are you good with that, Jeannie? Yes. Okay. okay so working. Take just a second. Okay, everyone should be able to speak at this point. Um, just please be conscientious of background noise um, since we have about 50 lines open right now.
So can someone from USDA answer Lauren Nichols' question? If not, Lauren, you know what? Well, I can find out the answer to that, and I will. Um, is there a way we can post the answer on the web? Or we can, some... we can, yeah. Well, we'll find. We'll, we can send an email to the to the attendees um, with the question. Okay, after. I will. I will get the answer to that, Lauren, and I will get it to you. Okay. Does anybody else have any questions? Okay. Oh, we're getting one typing in. I, I just wanted to add. I just wanted to add. This is Jeannie again. That um, Joe's comment about she's she's not experienced a project that didn't have loan funds, um, and and that's very true. Um, RD, because of the ability to provide rental assistance, uh, definitely tries to minimize the amount of grant funds that are uh, committed to a project. So typically. Um, you know, there, it would be extremely rare to find a project that had 100% grant funds. So. Okay. And, and Lauren, your, your question is, if David, if we're only using the loan, not the grant, do we need the um, Davis-Bacon, correct? Davis Bacon, the, the question reads, Davis, make sure I'm under. Davis Bacon wages are only required when using 516 funds, not 514. And she says correct at the end. She was okay. trying yeah, to so, okay. Well, I'll, we'll, I'll we'll, we'll double check on that. Yeah. Okay, we got another um, question in. Um, the presentation it, will be posted at the end of, the, by the end of the week on HACS website, if you just go to rollhome.org, it'll be a headline as soon as it's posted. Um, okay, um, Melissa Douglas, I will follow, or I'm sorry, Marissa, I'll follow up with you directly about um, your registration. Um, Eduardo, the um, application is not uh, the, the notice of funding availability is not available yet. It usually comes out in the spring, and then it has a 60 to 90 day response time typically, but um, we never quite know for sure when it's coming out. But this, the national office notifies us and the state offices, and if, if you're interested, I would make sure you notify your state office so they would let you know as soon as it's available too. And Joe, from my understanding, we do expect that it's going to be coming out sometime in the next 60 days. So if people are considering putting together an application, uh, please contact us as soon as possible so that we can begin looking at your project and helping you formulate a plan on uh, preparing that application. We have a question from Adrian. Adrian welcome Schultz. back from vacation. Yes. <laughs> welcome uh, back from vacation, Adrian. <laughs> What is um, the minimum, the minimum number, of number of units? Sorry, go ahead. Typically, there's not a, tip, a, num, a minimum number of units that's required. It's just a heck of a lot of work for uh, one or two units. So, um, you know, typically, I think probably some of the smaller ones I've seen is 10, 12. We're still accepting questions verbally. Most of the too. time that's, and I was just going to add to what Joe was saying, most of the time the number of units is going to be driven by the market study. We have two questions coming in. Um, we'll send it out via an email. Um, it, it probably it might be too difficult to post it, and we'll we'll get you the the uh, answers to that question. Um, we did get a 
do you, um, there is a response to the Davis Bacon question if you ladies want to read it, talk about it. Um, it says Davis Bacon wages construction finance with the assistance of Section 515 grant will be subject to the provisions of the Davis Bacon Act and the implementing regulations published by the U.S. Department of Labor, uh, 29 CFR Parts 1, 3, and 5. So it doesn't speak to 514. Which is the loan. So, yeah. yeah. So if your project is 100% loan funded, Davis-Bacon typically doesn't apply to instances where it's loan funding, financing. Uh, but when you have grant funds involved, you are definitely looking at Davis-Bacon wage rate requirements. Thank you for posting Thank you that. Thank for that, Faith. Okay, any last questions? Um, I want to thank the speakers today for doing a wonderful job to Joe and Jeannie um, and our sponsors, Tierra del Sol Housing Corporation and Community Resources and Housing Development Corporation through their grant agreement with USDA RHS. Um, I want to thank everybody who attended today's event. A, feed, a feedback evaluation will be sent later today, and your response is really appreciated. Um, a recording of the session and the materials will be posted later this week. Um, and uh, you you can find it on Hack's website okay. by Friday afternoon. We'll try and get it up there Stephanie, earlier. There's a, go ahead. Stephanie, sorry for interrupting you. There's a couple more questions. Um, it says, would it be possible to have both farm worker and senior housing in the same project and use the funding? Well, here's the kicker. Um, uh, you can do retired farm workers, but USDA is, uh, does not want mixed use projects, so uh, meaning farm worker and non-farm worker. So you can have retired farm workers and current farm workers in the same project, but um, not a mixture of uses. Okay. So I, I would like to add that uh, I think RD's um, concern is if you have a, a building where you've got floating units where it depends on uh, what unit is vacant, whether you occupy it with a farm worker or a retired person, they would prefer that the farm worker um, units be in a separate building. And because of that, I recommend that that property have its own separate legal description because you're dealing with two separate uh, funding sources that are going to be leaning the property, and sometimes it's just the path of least resistance and um, prevents the project from having um, multiple reporting requirements. It, obviously, if you've got uh, this, you know, two types of uses on the same parcel of property. And uh, then as far as Section 521 rental assistance, they are not considered grant funds. That is not the trigger for Davis-Bacon. And I see we have another question on Salmosas. And Salmo, do you have another question coming in, or are you just letting me know? There was come, one coming in earlier. Typically, yeah, the, the verbiage, like you said, so you had to use a message. Okay. Is there any final questions? I don't see anybody typing. Um, okay, so I, I said my thank you earlier. Please don't forget to complete your evaluations 
we will get those materials up for you as soon as we can. Thank you so much, everybody, and have a wonderful and day. Stephanie, I, Stephanie, I just wanted to add that web, the, the third webinar in this series will be focused on the construction and lease-up uh, processes after you close on your financing. So please be sure to join us. And thank you for your time today. See you all in two weeks. Bye-bye.